Hello and welcome to On Landscape. This has been a, uh, a quite a popular topic. We're talking about tilts and shifts in landscape photography. And one of the first things to talk about is probably why, why is anybody interested in using tilts and shifts? Well, let's separate the two because they're, they're very different things to begin with. Um, tilts first. I think that's the one that most people seem to have a problem with, so we'll, we'll talk about those first. The reason people want to use tilt is mostly to get more depth of field. Now, why not stop down more? Well, the reason is the, the res resolution that a lot of our lenses, a lot of our modern cameras have, is so high that diffraction starts to become a problem. Now, I'm sure a lot of you heard about diffraction and it causes a problem when you stop down to, let's say, f16. People don't like using f22 because things start to go blurry. However, if we use smaller apertures, or let's say larger apertures, um, then we don't get as much depth of field. Tilts allow us to change that, allow us to modify the plane of focus. Uh, now we've recorded a short uh, video on location in Bridlington explaining some of the key concepts and we'll be showing that in a few minutes uh, and, and that should give us a good introduction after we've shown the video we'll come back uh, maybe take a couple of questions and then go on to some more advanced topics uh, and these might be around uh, adapted lenses this is this is my Sony a7R with a Mirex adapter on it um, people use different sorts of adapters there is now uh, an almost technical camera that Cambo make where you can mount medium format lenses in front of a Sony a7R but the main reason if we keep in mind that people want to be able to have more depth of field that isn't possible without using tilts um, because you get into diffraction so this becomes more and more important as we get higher resolving cameras and the reason it's topical now is because we have the new Canon 5D-S and 5D-SR coming out. And these are 50 megapixel cameras. Now this is medium format territory. And the people who are using medium format digital are very often using movements, especially in landscape photography. Why landscape photography, you may say? Well, it's not necessarily just for landscape photography, but we have a, um, a type of photograph quite often which is foreground and background. We want to show the overall landscape with some context in front of it. Um, so before we go on a bit too further, now I apologise in advance, uh, halfway through you'll be hearing me doing some voiceovers. I'll have a voice like this because I've had flu over the weekend. Um, the short movie will go, it's about 20 minutes long so uh, we'll, we'll run that now uh, and join you in about 20 minutes time. It's March in Bridlington. It, it was never going to be warm, but we're here because it's some great subject matter behind us to test out our tilt shift lenses with. And to introduce the tilt shift, we, we looked at DSLRs and they were all a little bit too small and fiddly. So we thought we'd go back to basics. I've got my 10.8 camera out uh, and we can look at just how lenses and focus work. So, back to first principles. This is um, as basic a camera as you can get really, beyond pinholes. Uh, we have a front standard on a DSLR. This would just be the lens. We have a rear standard, uh, and this would be the sensor. And focusing on DSLRs is often done on internal elements. Sometimes you can see the front lens move in and out. But on a, an old style camera, focusing is done by racking the rear standard or front standard backs and forwards. So you're changing the distance between the two standards. If you want to focus far away, the two standards end up close together. If we want to focus close up, we move the standards further apart. Now this can give us the idea of how tilt works because if I want to focus part of the picture close up and part of the picture far away, I can tilt the rear of the camera and now this part of the picture which because it's upside down is the horizon is focused far away 
because it's closer together on the standards. And this part of the picture, which is my foreground at the bottom of the picture, we focused close up. And everywhere in between is uh, evenly spaced. So we end up with a planar focus. And this is effectively what's happening with your lens in a DSLR. Typically on most DSLRs, the front works. So if we look at the front standard here, we've got a slightly different situation that the, the front standard tilts. So this is the equivalent of your lens tilting forward and back. The same effect is happening though. Tilting this forward is the same as tilting this back. The distance for the horizon is far away, the distance for close up. So, given we can see how the large format camera works, we've got a DSLR here, and we can relate the two cameras to each other. So like I was saying before, the focus on modern lenses is quite often internal, so you can't see this uh, moving in and out of the lens as easily. But we've got very much the same thing. So if I undo this tilt and I tilt forward like that, this is exactly the same as what I have on the large format camera. Um, in terms of this, we have the tilted front plane and the vertical sensor. Now, we want to know how you actually focus this and how does this tilting affect focus? Where does the focal plane lie? And to demonstrate that, we're going to remove the DSLR for a moment and we're going to do a bit of camera magic. Uh, we'll reset everything here and we'll start looking at an actual scene. In order to do that, we'll use the scene behind us. So the first thing we want to do is work out how much tilt we need to put on the lens. Uh, and for this example, what we'll do is we'll, we'll put a load of tilt on uh, and we'll use one of my rules. It's actually a, a guy called Merkelinger's rules, but for, me, for now it's one of my rules, uh, to work out where the plane of focus is going to be based on this tilt. So let's start off doing that. So given this rather large amount of tilt, how do we work out where the plane of focus will sit? Well, Merkelinger, quite a while ago, came up with a, uh, a description of how tilt lenses worked. And I'm going to use my second tripod to illustrate that. Now he looked at the, a line traveling through the sensor, in my case, the eight by 10 piece of film, and a line passing through the lens. Uh, and he said, or he worked out, that where these two lines coincide will be the point where every single plane of focus will sit as you move the bellows backwards and forwards. So, as I focus further away, the plane of focus will drop towards the horizon, and I can actually focus beyond infinity. Now, there's a concept for you. And as I focus beyond infinity, the, the plane goes down and down. So given that, how do I work out how much tilt I need? Let's say I wanted to focus on the ground here. What I would do is I would draw a line through my sensor all the way down to the point where I want my plane of focus. I would then project that line back up onto the lens. And that angle there is the angle I need. Excuse me while I delete this up. It's the angle I need to get the plane of focus correct. So at this point of time, my plane of focus will tilt around the hinge point, which is now on the ground. So if I focus further away, it will drop down towards the ground. And as I focus closer, it will move back towards the lens. And if I focus at infinity, the plane of focus will be along the ground. So we need to know how that relates to our DSLR. And to do that, I'm going to set the tripod up lower down. And the principles should be the same. The sensor 
is now marked with a, a little water line. The plane of the lens is more difficult to calculate, but for this 24mm lens, we'll presume it's in the middle of the focusing ring. So if we draw a line down from the sensor, and then we draw a line up from the sensor to the lens, we can see approximately how much tilt we need. So this line needs to coincide with the line from the sensor. If that's true, as we focus now, our plane of focus will drop down to the ground or come up, always passing through the point below the sensor. As you can see with the DSLR, demonstrating some of the principles is more difficult because the lens is smaller, the sensor and the lens are very close together. So to show you a real-world example, we'll go back to using the 810 and take a photograph of the harbour here. So now I've set up my 10.8 camera and I've created the uh, composition I want. We just need to work out how much tilt is needed. And we're going to try and focus along the, the metal rail that runs next to the wheels in front of us. In order to do so, we're going to use our Merklinger rule again. And we draw a line through the sensor. Now this time, the sensor isn't vertical. So we have to draw a line, not vertically, but directly through, and we decide where our hinge point is. In order to work out the lens tilt we need for that, if I move it beyond the tripod, I drop the line forward, and as you can probably see, I need approximately that much tilt. So all that remains now is to look back at the shot and check why the plane of focus is now falling. So I can see now as I focus backwards and forwards, at a particular point, the whole of that rail comes into focus. Now I'd like to show you this on the back of the 8x10 camera. So we're just going to cut away to that. We've moved over to uh, Flambra now, um, and we're going to look at depth of field. Um, before I do that, uh, you'll notice I've got a different camera in front of me. This is uh, my main 5x4 camera and it has a couple of different features to it that help me do uh, tilt and shift. Um, one of these is a, something called asymmetric tilt. The first thing is just to recap how depth of field works with a normal lens. Um, if we think of this as the plane of focus and I'm looking in this direction here, the, um, I would typically focus on the foreground focus on the background, put my lens somewhere in the middle and work out the aperture needed to cover that block of depth of field. Now with our tilt lenses, as we discussed earlier, we have a, a hinge point and I'm, I'm going to use this top of the tripod bit here as a hinge. So we would focus and as we focus the plane of focus drops. So we would focus on the foreground, maybe there, focus on the background, maybe there, place the plane of focus in the middle somewhere and then use some sort of calculation to work out what aperture it would be. So we end up with a wedge shaped depth of field. Now this has a few implications, the first of which is that the depth of field in the foreground is quite often a lot smaller than the depth of field in the background. So we need to be more accurate typically in getting the foreground interest sorted out. Now we're going to use 
this knowledge to look at the scene behind us where we have uh, brambles in the foreground, we have a drop away with a World War II gun emplacement, we have some cliffs that are even lower than that and then we work up to the horizon through the wonderfully white Flamborough cliffs all the way up to the horizon line and, and a few clouds. Um, and bearing in mind what we talked about with our wedge of focus, we need to use this wedge to get the brambles in. We need to open the wedge out enough to get down into the World War II gun emplacement and that foreground cliff. And the top of the wedge needs to be going to the horizon line. So what we're going to do is we're going to cut away to a, a picture where we can talk through some of the examples. In order to show you where the plane of focus sits in our picture and also where the near and far bounds of the depth of field sit, we're using a piece of software I wrote uh, a year or two back which was written using JavaScript so it works within a web browser and it takes uh, various controls to simulate depth of field. And these controls are the, uh, the focal length of the lens, the aperture used, the, and more importantly, the lens tilt and the focus. So let's start off by looking at the scene with zero tilt. Now, the, the red line you see running vertically in the center of here we, we, is our plane of focus, and the dotted lines either side are our depth of field bounds. And if I focus in and out, we can see that focusing further away gives us more depth of field either side. We can also see that there is more depth of field on the far side of the picture than the near side of the picture. And as we focus closer, the depth of field gets less and less. Now let's try applying one degree of tilt. So there we go, there is our one degree of tilt. And you'll notice that when I apply that tilt, the point on the left-hand axis goes up and down. Now this is the Merklinger hinge line we mentioned earlier. So let's go put it back onto our one degree. So what does focus do at this point in time? Well, if I focus further away, we can see that the plane of focus drops down towards the horizontal, as we saw earlier. But the depth of field either side now forms the wedge we spoke about. And as I focus closer to the camera, we can see that the plane of focus becomes more and more vertical. And the depth of field gets less and less. And also the depth of field is slightly more on the far side of the picture, on the bottom of the plane of focus than it is on the left side. Now, in order to focus on our scene here, one of the things we'll have to do is focus beyond infinity. Now, well, that great concept again. So let's look at focusing further and further away until our depth of field covers the scene we want. So there we go. My near and far lines, the dotted lines, now cover all of the scene. However, they don't cover the bracken, sorry, the bramble we had in the foreground. So I'm going to change to a another picture now, briefly. And this shows a close-up. It shows me with my beanie hat on, uh, the lighthouse in the background. So we're doing some strange things with point of view here, so just ignore those for the moment. And we can see the bramble in the foreground. So we'll put our lens tilt back on. And what we want now is we want to tilt such that the depth of field covers both the bramble in the foreground and the cliffs in the background. Now there are a few different ways of doing this. We can apply a lot of tilt and focus a little bit further down so that our plane of focus actually drops from the bramble at the top and goes right the way to the bottom of the scene so the plane of focus is almost into the brambles and brackens at the bottom of the hill here. So most of the bram bramble is in focus and most of the scene is in focus. 
What we could also do is put a little bit less tilt on and focus a little bit higher. And now our bramble is in focus, our plane of focus lies horizontally and all of the background is in focus. The one thing you'll notice here that's quite important to remember is that as you apply more and more tilt to a scene, the depth of field gets less and less. So it was always in our best interests to apply as little tilt as possible to solve the problem. So in this case we could apply less tilt, point the focus focal plane slightly up, we can use a larger aperture which hopefully should give us less diffraction and hence better resolution. Now what you should take away from this simulation I've just shown is firstly reiterating the way that lens tilt moves the hinge line up and down, focusing the camera changes the slope of the plane of focus and also the slope of the near and far sides of the depth of field. And at the depth of field itself encompasses a wedge-like shape. And the other things that are important we've just mentioned are the fact that adding more tilt is often tempting to try and solve a problem but more tilt means less depth of field. So sometimes it's worth using not much tilt at all to solve a problem. The tilt shift lenses for DSLR cameras are designed in a certain way so that they always point at the sensor. Now if we look at this camera here and we see it tilting, we can see that the light rays that come out of the lens are directed towards the sensor here and even when it's tilted to its fullest extent it still points directly to the camera. In fact, this, this curvature that is used means that the, the very centre of the frame should stay in focus, regardless of whether you tilt up and down. So one of the techniques we can use for finding the correct tilt is to find a point in the centre of the scene that we want in focus. So in this case, it may be the, 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 the cliffs and the beach focus on that with no tilt and then move the tilt backwards and forwards and as we move the tilt backwards and forwards that area should stay in focus and then we can look at the foreground and watch as the foreground comes in and out of focus. Now, it's not going to work for every scene because you might not have something right in the middle of the picture that needs to be in focus but it's very handy for scenes like this where you can do that. The 4.5 camera I use has something similar called asymmetric tilts where there is a a line at the bottom of the quarter of the camera that stays in focus all the time. So I can focus on that, which is typically a horizon, tilt the back of the camera until the foreground comes in focus, and there's only two movements. So there isn't as much as this iteration backwards and forwards. We're back in Bridlington, and this time we're looking at the shift capability of the tilt shift lenses. Now the shift capability is commonly known as a, a function that allows you to get rid of converging verticals, for instance if you're taking architectural photography. This time we're in a boatyard and we're looking at the hoist behind us and we've pointed the camera directly up to try and take a picture of the, all the, uh, the cabling and the gears um, and everything's converging. Now if I was a technical camera user what I want to do is make sure I set the camera up so the back of the camera is vertical. So. camera vertical and instead of pointing the camera up we're going to shift the lens up and as we can see in this case we've slightly run out of shift but we can still point up slightly and we've got rid of most of the converging verticals And finally, we're back in Flamborough, 
And I did mention earlier that there are other ways to work out how to apply the tilts needed for a scene and to focus it. One of those techniques we have is to work out for various distances below the sensor how much tilt we need to apply. Because as we come down, let's say, 50 centimetres below the sensor, we can work out from the hinge line that we need to apply, let's say, four degrees of tilt. And if we were 100 centimetres below the sensor, it would only be two degrees of tilt. So it's easy to take either a, a, a little notepad with you with all these values switched on, and when you find a scene, you measure directly below the sensor, work out the distance. That then tells you how much tilt to apply, and all you have to do is focus on it. And that will be enough to get you in the ballpark for your picture. That's it for the field part of our introduction to tilt photography. We're going back live now where we'll be looking into more esoteric aspects of using tilts. And we'll also be answering some of your questions that you can send in via Facebook or Twitter. I hope I uh, didn't scare you too much with my beard and hat. Um, that is a brief uh, reasonably brief introduction to the concepts of tilt and shift. Um, as I say, we're trying to concentrate on, on tilt mostly because that's the, uh, the concept that a lot of people find it difficult to grasp. Now, if you want to have a look at the simulators we mentioned earlier uh, and you saw, um, they're, they're all on uh, one of my servers. Now, I'm gonna, I can email a link to my colleague to uh, put out on Twitter. So if you want to have a play with that, feel free. Um, but what we're going to do now is go through some of the questions we've had in. Now, people ask a lot of questions. Um, and I've tried to group those into different topics to try and make the most of them. So if I don't mention your names, um, apologies in advance. But one of the first questions and one of the topics that came up in the video is whereabouts is the lens plane on a DSLR camera? On a, on a camera like this, on a 5.4 camera, it's quite easy to work out where the lens plane is because these are symmetric lenses, so it's, it's right in the middle of the lens. On a DSLR or SLR camera, it's a little bit more difficult because of the way the retrofocal lenses work. So the 24mm tilt shift and if we can go to the uh, screen please this is a picture of the side of uh, it was a Canon 6D I was using with a 24 millimeter tilt shift lens now in the video I spoke about the lens plane being going through the focusing ring I didn't know where the lens plane was I don't use these these lenses as often as I do uh, and since having a look at that, I've found out where the lens plane is and it should be fairly obvious it's at 24 millimetres from the sensor. So if you look here, you can see that it's, it's going through very close to where the lens mount is. I've also marked on uh, the 40mm the lens plane. Um, so if you want to know where the lens plane is for your particular lens, regardless of whether it's a retrofocal lens or a normal lens, it will always be the particular distance away from the sensor that relates to your focal plane. Now the other thing on this, uh, this image I'm showing is that the DSLR lenses are configured in such a way as to always try to project the image circle onto the sensor. So you can see I've, I've drawn a circular red line on the picture. Um, which corresponds with the arc that the lens travels in when you tilt it. Now, I've worked out that the, the exact origin of that circle is, corresponds with the sensor plane. What this means, theoretically, is as you tilt your lens, you will never end up shifting outside the image circle. Um, and also, there should be a point in the center of the, your picture that doesn't move out of focus. Now I'll, I'll, I'll show what that means in a picture I have here, which I did some pictures of the side of my house wall. And what I've done is I've used a, a tool called Find Edges in Photoshop. 
So, first of all, I focused on the, the side of the brick wall, so everything was in focus. And then I gradually applied more and more tilt. Now you can see there that after applying, uh, I think that was a maximum amount of tilt allowed on that lens, I've got one line that's in focus. And this is, allows us to use a technique whereby we find something in the picture that's approximately on this line. Now for some reason it's slightly away from the centre of the picture. Um, but if we focus on something on that line, it means that we can tilt the lens to bring everything in focus, as mentioned uh, in the short movie we did. Um, <clears throat> so that means that the 24mm lens plane is quite reasonably difficult to place, but uh, if we have the table of measurements that we also mentioned in the video, you can get a, a quick idea of where to place the, the tilt. Um, another question was about vignetting with shifts and tilts. Now, all, all lenses vignette to a certain extent, wide-angle lenses uh, more so. Now, the, the tilt lenses have a very large image circle, and, and what, what do I mean by image circle? It's not a concept that DSLR or uh, digital camera users may know of. Now, I'm going to come back to this picture shortly. But effectively, what an image circle is, it's, it's how much, how big the projected image is that comes through the back of a lens. Now, if I use this camera as an example, this my 5.4 camera, I have a, a lens on the front of here, which is a 110 millimeter lens. It's, it's the equivalent to a uh, 24 mil esque um, focal length. And I look at the back of it and I get my 24 millimeter equivalent picture. In actual fact, this, this lens is projecting an image on the back of my camera that is almost twice as big as my sensor. And this, this is what allows you to um, move the sensor around or move the lens up and down and still have a picture. So as I, as I apply lots of rise to my lens, the image circle, the very large image circle moves up, but my sensor is still seeing part of the picture. Now, if you go back to the, the screen for a second, I have an example here which shows you um, sort of what I'm referring to. This is a photograph by Joe Cornish called 99 Steps. Now it's taken in, in Whitby and it uses this concept of the image circle to um, do a few tricks. We'll come back to that in a moment. But what, what we actually have, if I were to draw in a, a square, so that would be our image circle. I'm just going to make it really always in red. So the red box you see there is uh, the sensor on the back of the camera. The black line is the image circle that the lens is projecting. Now effectively what we have here is a, is a very, very wide angle lens. So at the 24 millimeter tilt shift, for instance, projects an image circle a lot bigger than it needs to be. And, and effectively, if I were to put that 24 millimeter lens and make the most of the image circle, which I'd have to use a medium format piece of film or a medium format sensor, the equivalent focal length would be something like a, uh, an 18 millimeter lens. What this means is as I start to use the edge of the lens circle, so instead of having my sensor right in the middle of the image circle, I have the sensor right on the edge of the image circle, I'm starting to see a lot more vignetting. So the natural vignetting of the lens starts in the middle and gets darker and darker as we get to the edge. And because our picture, now we've applied a lot of shift, is right at the edge of that image circle, it means it gets all the vignetting that would be associated with it. And interestingly, that means that the vignetting is no longer symmetrical, so it no longer 
starts in the center of your picture and gets darker towards the edges. The lightest part of the picture will now be at the very top and the darkest part of the picture will be at the very bottom. So yes, you will have some odd things happening with vignetting and tilt lenses. You need to have an idea of whereabouts in your image circle you're working. Typically with a <coughs> With a DSLR lens, um, as we mentioned earlier, as you tilt, it keeps your picture in the center of the image circle. So you shouldn't get too much vignetting, no more than you would, would do with a normal lens. It's when you apply shift to the lens that these effects start to take over. Um, another question that came in was about uh, teleconverters. Can we use teleconverters with tilt shift lenses? And the answer is yes, with the same um, caveats as you would have with any other lens. Um, you do lose some resolution, you do end up with some more aberrations, uh, and they would be uh, proportionally more with a 2 times teleconverter than a, a one4 times teleconverter. So because you lose a little bit of resolution, it also makes it slightly harder to focus, possibly. Um, one of the things that you may get with teleconverters, and somebody has mentioned that this is a possibility, is you get more field curvature. Now, what do I mean by field curvature? There are some lenses, because of their design, that don't have a flat plane of focus. Uh, for instance, I believe the Nikon 28mm has a particularly uh, curved plane of focus. And what this means is if you focus on, a, let's say, a wall, and you focus in the center of the wall, then the corners will be out of focus. They will, they will be focused slightly closer towards you, for instance. Now, tilt lenses, or tilt shift lenses, uh, are as prone to this as any other lenses. Uh, again, I've, I've been told that the Nikon 24mm PCE lens suffers from this effect. Um, what, it, what it means is that as you put your tilt onto the lens and you're projecting a plane of focus, uh, let's say foreground to background, you end up with a dip in your plane of focus. So you may be trying to focus something in the, uh, on the ground in the foreground and, and some trees in the background or whatever, and as you look in the mid-ground where you would expect to be in focus, it's no longer, no longer there. Um, it's, it's worth checking whether your lens suffers from this by doing the, the brick wall test. Uh, focus wide open uh, with no movements against the brick wall. Take a photograph when it's focused in the center of the image, take a photograph when it's on the edge of the image and check seeing how much shift you're getting between the two. Um, <coughs> we're going to just look at some of the different methods for focusing now. We've, we've covered a couple in the, the article. Um, but let's, let's review the ones we, we had in the article. The first one would be using some form of lookup table. Now these were available online. Uh, we're going to have an article in the next issue that will have a list of these for um, the various common lenses. Um, so you'll be out in the field, you, you would carry your list of tables with you on a, on a pad or on an iPhone. Um, roughly measure the distance. You, what I've done in the past is I've worked out how high the tripod is based on segment length. So if I know my tripod segment length is 40 centimeters, 50 centimeters, I know in relation to that how far down the ground is. And, and this typically has been enough to get me fairly close in the past. Another method of um, getting accurate focus with tilt shift lenses that has become more popular. I know a few people who enjoy using it is to use the focus peaking that's available on some modern cameras, such as the Sony a7R. Now you could use the, the multiple features together, so I may decide that I want to use the, a lookup table to get me in the right ballpark. Uh, I would then use live view to, to see how the focus is doing and use focus peaking, which allows you to, you, you see some red speckling or uh, uh, red fairy dust 
on the picture, on the, on the back of the camera, which shows the areas which are high contrast, and which typically means they're in focus. Um, the other ways of um, looking up, we mentioned earlier, is the, is the Merkling one, where, where we look at the side of the camera, and we work out, project the sensor down, project the lens plane down, and we'll know roughly what amount of tilt we need. Um, for DSLRs, it doesn't work as well, to be honest. Um, you'd be better off using a lookup table, I think. It might be nice if you're in the field and you don't happen to have the lookup table with you or you've lost it, so you can get a rough idea. But um, I had an email off somebody when I was preparing this talk saying, well, it doesn't need to be this complicated, does it? Uh, and he was absolutely right. He uses tilt lenses, but he doesn't use any lookup tables. He doesn't use any tilt shifts. He doesn't even use live view. Uh, he puts the camera to his eye. Uh, he puts on some tilt uh, and, and does everything instinctively through the viewfinder. Now, this sounds completely anathema to most of the technical photographers you might know who want to get everything perfectly accurate. If we're going to use tilt, we focus absolutely wide open and make sure all our key elements are in focus wide open. There's no reason we should do this. It's not something we do with a normal lens. It's impossible with a normal lens. When, when we have no movements, we focus somewhere arbitrarily into the scene and we stop down to encompass everything else. And we can do approximately the same thing with, uh, with tilt lenses. Now, if we can go back to the screen again, uh, I can explain some of this using our, our simulator. Now, if I, if I take most of the tilt off this scene, and I focus, let's say I'm focusing uh, hyperfocally, roughly. So my plane of focus is the solid red line. My near point of focus is um, the dotted line you can see to the left. Uh, my far point in the depth of field is just gone off the screen on the right. You'll notice something happening as I, as I apply tilt to this. The point in the center of the picture, the point down the axis of the lens, stays in the same position. What happens is, as we do it, as we apply tilt, the hinge line starts coming up, as we talked about before. So the more tilt we put on, the higher this hinge line goes. And what we've done effectively is we've sacrificed some depth of field in the sky for some depth of field close to the camera. Now, if I wanted to say, well, I know that my scene, so with, with zero degrees of tilt on there, I know um, I need some foreground focus, but the rest of the scene is absolutely fine. I can do my hyperfocal focusing here. As I apply some tilt, effectively, it gives me some extra focus in this foreground area. And I don't need to be absolutely accurate in applying that tilt because as soon as I've stopped down to, I mean, I, let me just look in my system here. I'm, I'm working on f5.6. So let me just stop down to f11. All of a sudden, my depth of field is covering a multitude of sins in focusing. My, my plane of focus might not be traveling exactly through the points that I needed to be in focus. But by the time I've stopped down, everything works. And, and this is what this uh, gentleman who emailed me was saying. He does portraiture. He does group shots uh, around a table. He, he does shots in, of, of architecture. And he'll use this method. He'll uh, handhold the camera, apply an approximate amount of tilt, and stop down. And there's nothing, nothing wrong with doing that. Um, and I think if we were to, to give somebody a table uh, as we've discussed earlier, to say that if you, if you were standing at eye level, you would use this amount of tilt roughly. If you were crouching down, you'd use roughly this amount of tilt. Uh, but make sure you stop down. Uh, and I think it would work on most occasions. So 
you don't need to get everything in focus when you're wide open. Um, it's, it's getting close and stopping down is not a problem, just as it's not a problem when we do it with, without using tilts. Now there is, a, there is another uh, way of using um, tilt, focusing tilt lenses, um, and it's an iterative way of focusing. I'll go through this more in the article that's coming, going to be coming out in, in about a week's time. But effectively, this relies on um, knowing that when you focus, the, when you focus further away and you focus closer, the, this relationship stays the same. Um, and I'm not going to go into, into details there, but it's, there is a point. If I were to focus on a scene and <coughs> I focus on the foreground, um, and if, um, I'm, I'm using a depth of field sc scale on this. If I focus on the foreground and then focus on the background, the relationship with the markings on my camera remain intact. So effectively, I focus further away um, and the scene looks like it, it, it's getting further away. So I, I, as I go from the foreground to the background, uh, I can see I focus further away to get the, the far point more in focus. I can then apply tilt, so I apply some tilt, do the same thing, and the same thing should happen. As I focus on the foreground, then move to the background, I should focus further away on the markings on the lens. As I keep applying tilt, I'll have to make smaller adjustments as I get closer to a, an accurate plane of focus. If I over tilt, if I tilt too far, when I go to the foreground, focus there and move to the background, all of a sudden, the relationship on the uh, lens will go wrong. I will have to focus closer to get the far point in focus. And that sounds, that sounds quite alien, um, but it, it, it does make sense, and it makes sense if I try and show some diagrams of this. Uh, so I'm going to reserve that for the next article, because I've got quite a few questions to cover. Um, briefly, I'm going to go on to stitching. Um, and this is a question that a few people have asked. It's, I can use a tilt shift lens for stitching. How, how, how is that possible? Now, there's a lot of articles been written on this and basically it relies on the fact that, uh, and if I go back to my diagram on the screen again for a second, um, we have our image circle. Normally, my sensor sits in the image center of the image circle. And I'm going to put a red line on it there. And I take a single frame. If I shift all the way to the left by half a frame and take a photograph, I'm going to make this blue. And then I shift half a frame to the right and take a photograph. What I've effectively done is used more of the image circle of the lens. Uh, it, it's the equivalent of me creating a medium format sensor by, by taking two samples of the image circle. Now, there is a problem with this, with uh, most tilt shift lenses. Typically, you mount your lens on the front of the camera, and as you shift, you move the lens backwards and forwards. And you'll notice the sensor isn't moving. And this can cause parallax issues. So as I, if I'm working on some foreground matter, if I had some, a, a branch or a column, as I move the lens from one side to the other, the parallax between the foreground and the background changes. So stitching the two pictures will become very difficult. Now there are two ways around this. Um, this is a, a Myrex adapted lens. And what it comes with is it comes with a foot on the adapter. Now, this means that instead of mounting the tripod to the camera, the tripod 
and the lens is mounted to the tripod via this adapter. Now when I apply shift, the camera moves backwards and forwards, which is the sensor moving backwards and forwards as we saw on the screen. If you don't have a leg on your tripod, and, and I don't believe any of the DSLR lenses do have legs on them, I think there may be a Schneider lens that does, um, but that's it. What you can do instead is to, and I might not be as easy to demonstrate on this, but you mount your camera to the um, tripod. You then shift your lens over half a frame and then shift your camera over half a frame in the other direction. This means the lens is at the same place it started. And then when it comes to taking the second shot, you shift your lens one frame to the right and shift your camera one frame to the left. Now you can done I've done this before by putting some markings on my L brackets that correspond with a line on my uh, um, Arca Swiss head and it works on my Arca Swiss head because the, I've, I've aligned my mounting plate with the L bracket so it, everything can slide as soon as I loosen it off. Now for, for far distant views where you don't have close foreground or where the foreground doesn't matter as much for stitching together you don't need to do this but for accurate flat stitching I would recommend it. Now, what, there is another advantage to um, flat stitching like this, and that is the perspective of the view remains like a lens. It remains equirectangular. Now, people will have seen when we do a panoramic image, if we turn to the left and take a photograph, look to the foreground, four, and take a photograph, turn to the right and take a photograph, our picture is, is an unwrapped sphere. So unlike a very wide angle lens, where things get stretched a little bit on the corners, um, we have um, a, sometimes it, uh, it could look more natural view. However, lines that should remain straight in a picture end up curved. So if we want those lines to remain straight, for instance, in architecture or for other reasons, then an equirectangular or lens-like perspective is useful. So, in these situations, uh, especially in things like architecture, flat stitching like this can be very useful. Okay, back, back to the tilts again. There are a few things we can do with tilt lenses that are quite useful, crafty, I would say almost. And one of these uh, is, is um, changing perspective, using the image circle of the lens to allow us to change the perspective, look and feel of a picture. Now, one of Joe's images that, I, that you can see on screen at the moment, it's called 99 Steps, taken in Whitby. Um, and it, quite a few people have tried to copy this picture, uh, and I imagine they've, they've probably had a few problems with it because it's actually taken with a very, very wide angle lens but the one thing you'll notice that is that the, the, the lamp in the top left looks quite normal. It isn't stretched in any fashion. And the reason for that is because he hasn't used, Joe hasn't used the lens in its normal central position. Now to know how this worked, you need to realise that, as, we, as you may already know, the centre of a lens doesn't get any perspective distortion. Most of the perspective distortion happens at the edge of a lens. Joe obviously knows this, and he, Joe will have pointed his uh, large format camera um, directly at, or very close to, the lamp, and then shifted the sensor, or his film, down and across. And so what that's done is it's meant that the, the lamp itself doesn't get distorted, as we can see there. 
and all of the stretchy distortion that you would normally see at the edge of a wide angle lens is happening down in the corner here where this bench is. And unfortunately, because there isn't anything that gives away that perspective, that wide angle perspective, it doesn't look unnatural. So the, the picture doesn't look like it was taken on a very wide angle, wide angle lens, but I think I asked Joe a while ago and he said it was taken on a 72 mil which is probably about a 18 millimeter equivalent. And this can be used for various things. I uh, did a demonstration a while back. Um, now this is a picture of what happens if you put my head on the edge of a wide angle lens. And some of you may go, hey Tim, you normally look like that. Well, I feel like I look like that at the moment, but anyway, that's besides the point. So, that's on the very edge of a 24 millimeter uh, tilt shift lens. Now it, it looks even wider than 24 millimeter and it, it probably is because the, the distortion is right at the edge of the image circle. Now I can get rid of that distortion by, by instead pointing the lens directly at my head and then shifting the center to the right. So these are both taken with exactly the same lens on the same camera. I'll go back to the first one again. And obviously you can, you can decide uh, to do this anywhere in between the two. So this is quite a useful feature for portraiture. Um, if you want to do environmental portraits where your um, subject uh, isn't going to be at the center of the frame but you don't want to see the wide angle distortion because you may be taking a picture inside their room you can use this technique point the lens directly at your subject and then shift your sensor around to recompose another technique that was mentioned in uh, our questions was looming now we've talked about looming before and to give you an example of looming, um, here's a scene that I encountered uh, in a place called Three Cliffs Bay uh, in Nagawa. Now the red circle is highlighting some succulents, um, little cactusy style plants that we found in the sand dunes. Now this isn't the shot that I came away with this is this is my scouting shot and then after I'd taken it I saw these small plants the shot I came away with was this one now you can see now that those succulents are looking a lot bigger than they do in that picture there and this is because of two things. One, I've moved a lot closer, so therefore the succulents appear bigger in the picture. But also, again, I've used that same distortion that we were talking about before. So if I go back to that, that scene with my head in it, if I wanted to make my head bigger, instead of pointing the camera directly at my head, I put my head on the edge of the frame. So in other words, I shift the sensor to the very edge of the image circle and place the thing I want to look a lot bigger on at that very edge. So we go back to the succulent picture. My image circle here, if I can just demonstrate this. Something like that. Let's try that there.
So that would be the image circle on my lens. And I would have moved my sensor down to be able to take the picture. So effectively, if I was taking this picture and this was my camera, I would point the camera directly forward and then shift the lens down to take the picture. So instead of pointing the camera down at the scene, I would point the camera horizontally and shift the lens down, thereby using the edge of the image circle. By the way, if anybody's interested, this is the new tripod head from Manfrotto. This will be reviewed in the next issue as well. So the looming effect has been used to, to great success by uh, people like Joe Cornish and David Munch to, to create this in, in very uh, dynamic relationship between foreground and background. Um, excuse me while I get my uh, Photoshop. Back sorted again. Um, it's a field. Uh, we've done field curvature. Um, lens adapters. Um, now, typically, the, the only choices that we had to use tilt lenses was to buy a dedicated tilt lens for a 35mm camera. So if you're on a, a Canon system, you would have a choice of a 24mm uh, I think it's a 45 mil and a 90 mil. Um, if you're on a Nikon, I think that you get roughly the same trimvirus of, of lenses. The other option that came about recently was to use some tilt adapters, or uh, if I can find them, I've got a lot of equipment lying around here, so there, here we go. Is to use medium format lenses such as Hasselblads and to mount them on an adapter that allows tilts and shifts. Now these are some very good options. Um, for instance, some of the Hasselblad lenses are better resolving some, than some of the best medium format digital lenses. Uh, Joe Cornish is now using a 40mm Hasselblad, I think it's a CFE lens, that was one of the last um, lenses made for the old Hasselblad system. And it not only is one of the most beautiful lenses, it's also one of the sharpest lenses he's got. The only downside of these lenses is the widest is typically 40mm or maybe 35mm. This is because on a, on a medium format camera system, such as this one, which is a, uh, a Bronica SQ8, the, um, a wide angle lens would be a 50 millimeter. So a 50 mil millimeter lens on a Bronica would be about 25 millimeter, 24 millimeter. And a 40 millimeter lens would be maybe 19 millimeters, fairly wide. So if you want to use wide angle lenses, you are stuck. You can either stitch, doing a flat stitch like we talked before, so you can effectively make your sensor bigger by doing it in two halves. Um, or uh, you can just use a normal flat 24mm lens. There is now a new option though. This is the fact that mirrorless cameras are becoming more popular. This is my Sony a7R. Um, it has a full frame sensor, but the advantage it has is that the, the distance between the sensor and the lens mount is about 19 millimeters, um, which is about half that of, uh, of a Canon or a Nikon, because the Canons and the Nikons need to have a, a mirror in between the lens and the sensor. This gives you quite a lot of room to mount uh, adapters. And in this case, it's a tilt adapter. So I've got a tilt adapter that allows me to use Canon EF lenses 
on my Sony system, but with tilt and shift. So, shift. The main limitation of these uh, adapters are the fact that the tilt only goes one direction and the shift goes 90 degrees to the tilt. Um, the downside of that means that if you want to apply tilt and drop or rise, so let's say you wanted to take some pictures of the bottom of some trees and you didn't want to have converging verticals, you wouldn't be able to do it. You would either have to choose between using tilt to get everything in, in, in focus the way you wanted it to and to correct the verticals or to get the verticals right using the lens and then uh, stop down for the depth of field. There is, there is another option which I've been trying out whilst I was in Iceland, which is to use two adapters. So if I take off my Sony 24mm lens, uh, now these may, may clash with each other because I haven't used these together since mounting this. So bear with me a moment. There we go. So now I have a Sony to Canon EF Myrex tilt adapter. And then in front of that, a Canon EF to Mami 645 tilt adapter with a Bronica adapter on front of it. Now, a lot of people say, ah, too many adapters. Um, there's your, your, your tolerances will be all out. And the answer to that is, we're using tilts. It doesn't matter. Uh, the, the idea is to have the tolerances out. Um, if we need everything to be square, we'd check when we took the photograph. But the nice thing about this is it allows us to tilt in one direction here and then to shift the lenses up or down on the front so we can get our perspectives corrected and we can get our tilt movements. Uh, we can also apply tilt in two directions. So we can put our uh, tilt on to get near far focus. And we can also put some tilt on the back if I can work out how to actually get it to apply at the moment. I think it's a, I've locked that down. Um, to put some swing on. And if I wanted to, I could even use both tilt adapters to apply, I think, how many degrees of tilt do I have there? I'm now applying 20 degrees of tilt, I believe, if that's not stuck. There you go, that's 10 degrees of tilt. Um, these two have hit each other, so it's 17 degrees of tilt. So if you're doing very close-up work, where your planes of focus get more complicated, then that allows you to do it. Now, what you have then is a, a, a choice of any lens. So you can use any medium format lens. As far as recommendations for good medium format lenses, um, I've been told, and I now have experience of the fact that the Bronica lenses are very good, uh, especially the Bronica 40 millimeter lens. The Hasselblad lenses are varied. Um, they go from being okay. Uh, I think the, there's a 50 millimeter Hasselblad Distagon that's okay. Uh, and then there's a 40 mil CFE, which I've spoken about, which is extraordinary. Um, but you could use Pentax lenses that are intended for the Pentax 6.7 or Pentax 6.45. Um, what I've found most interesting recently is using uh, Canon FD lenses. Now, there's a chap online called Eddie Houston, the lens doctor, who takes Canon FD lenses and replaces the mount on the back because the, the, you can't use FD lenses very easily. The, the, the distance between the lens and the sensor is just a little bit shorter than the Canon EF. So he adapts them to Canon EF, which means I can now use these on my tilt adapter. And I've discovered that they are very, very sharp lenses indeed. Uh, another article will cover that soon. But the advantage is, uh, uh, somebody asks in our questions, won't you run out of image circle using these lenses? 
Well, just as we spoke about the, the Canon tilt shift lenses, the fact that as you tilt, it keeps the center of the uh, image circle focused on the sensor. The same things happen with the Myrex adapter. So as I rotate the sensor behind the lens, all that's happening is the sensor is turning around. So the, the image that's projected on the sensor stays within the sensor. So in short, no, you're fine. In fact, the image circle projected from these FD lenses uh, gives me about five mil of shift either side. Um, going back to one of the other factors about um, using tilts, there is a, an issue called the bellows factor that is probably more important to film photographers than for digital photographers. When you focus uh, very close, um, near to life size, um, let's say one to one or two to one, things get darker. Because the light rays are, are diverging, you're moving the lens, the sensor further away from the lens to focus, then inevitably um, the, the illumination gets less. So in fact it gets two stops less by the time you get to life size. The same happens when you're using tilt shift lenses. But with a tilt shift lens, when you apply a lot of tilt, such as in this photograph, where the, the succulent is probably near life size, it means I've effectively got uh, a picture that's two stops darker in the foreground than the middle ground. So this area in the very bottom of the picture, for, probably from the tip of the succulent's leaves down to the bottom, will be two stops darker than the remainder of the picture. So what I had to do in this case is to put a grad over the rest of the picture to bring everything back up. With the, with the dynamic range you've got on, on modern sensors, you may not see this. Um, but for the film users out there, it's, it can be quite significant. The way to work this out, if anybody's ever used a, uh, an Expo disc, I think it's called, which is a little... Um, it's a circular device you can put into the picture and you measure the size of it on the back of the ground glass. Um, it will tell you how much bellows compensation you need and you can do that for the foreground. Uh, the reverse is true as well though. If I focused on the centre of a scene and, and tilted to bring the foreground into focus, I would actually be focused beyond infinity in the sky. Now that's, again, it's a, it's a very strange concept, but it's something that David Ward told me a while ago. He said, if, you, if you're using large, large tilts where you have a lot of sky in the picture and you find yourselves overexposing the sky repeatedly, it's for this reason. Um, the foreground has got darker because you've used tilts and the background, i.e. the sky, has got lighter. So it's, he, he uses a, a, a sort of rule of thumb half a stop extra um, grad for the sky if he's using quite a lot of tilt. Um, it's another one we'll try and cover it in the article. So, so th there we go, that's, that's as much as the questions we've received from anybody. I'm going to look to my, my assistant, ask if there's any, any, any more questions. Uh, and how are we doing for time? Yeah. Um, if you have any more questions, I will be writing an article about the subject for the next issue in, of the magazine. I apologise for the issues at the start of the recording uh, and my voice, which is probably nearly going now. Um, let us know if you've got any questions uh, and anything you would like expanded on for the article. Um, in the meantime, oh, thank you very much for watching uh, and hope to see you again for the next webinar.